Good morning and welcome to my studio. I'm Russell Smith and today I'd like to talk about an idea that comes up frequently with representational art and that's the idea of accuracy. Now the term accuracy is one that's tossed around a lot in representational art and that's especially true with artwork that serves as historical narratives. Now within the sphere of that term there are different degrees of what we think of as accuracy but speaking in very general terms accuracy in representational art can often make or break an image. Now in representational art a lot of emphasis is often placed on getting the details and the facts right. And this is especially true in aviation art, but I see it a lot in Western art too. After all, aviation by nature is a technical subject and history, both aviation and Western history, is grounded in hard facts. I once read an article in American Arts Quarterly that described this type of realism as clinical realism. And it's a type of realism that really only came into its own during the modern age. It's a depiction of reality based on everyday commonplace facts and on the assumption that face value is all that there is to reality. Now in order to create paintings that are both technically and historically correct, I have a lot of tools available to me that I've collected over the years. Those include various techniques to create things such as accurate perspective drawings, a large collection of historical books covering both aviation and Western subjects, and literally tens of thousands of reference photos that I've collected over the years. These assets all aid in getting details right. Now we all know this painting, Washington Crossing the Delaware by Emanuel Gottlieb Lloyds. About 20 years ago, I was showing my work at an event here in the local area, and I was set up next to another artist, another local guy, and we, over the course of the weekend, started talking about this idea of accuracy. And at one point he said to me, you know that painting of Washington crossing the Delaware? He says, I would hate to be the guy that painted that. Well, naturally my curiosity was piqued, and so I decided to take the bait and I said, okay, why would you hate to be the guy that painted that? And he said, well, you know, think about the painting. First of all, it's almost daylight in the scene. That's not midnight. And second of all, it's the wrong kind of boat. And Washington probably wouldn't have been standing up. And that's not even the Delaware River. It's the Danube River. Lloyds was in Europe when he painted that. Now, I didn't say this to him. I just let him continue on with this idea. But in my head, I thought, wow, I would love to be the guy that painted that. That's an incredible painting. It's, it's bold, it's dynamic, it's beautifully handled, and it's one of the most iconic paintings in American history. I would love to be the guy that painted that. Well, ever since that discussion 20 years ago, I've been mulling over in my head the question of what does it mean to be accurate? How does one qualify realism anyway? Why does the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware resonate on such a profound level that it works in spite of its historical inaccuracy. Well, the conclusion I've come to over the years, and I think what this gentleman failed to understand, is that in addition to technical and, and historical accuracy, there are actually two other types of accuracy which are more important to good representational art but are often overlooked. The first type is visual accuracy. Now, when I say visual accuracy, I'm not just referring to the accurate rendering of values and colors. Those are very important, but that's another subject in and of itself. What I'm asking is, what would your eyes and your brain really be able to perceive in a given situation? Now, I've seen some artists who have a bad habit of painting what they expect to see rather than what they would actually see, and to me, this is an amateurish mistake. Certain details may be important in, the, in that they provide the viewer with the necessary information to accurately interpret the image. Other details might add to a scene, but if rendered too sharply, may not be true to the way that the human eye would actually perceive them in a given situation. These elements might work best if left to the viewer's imagination. This is what I'd like to refer to as suggestive information. Now, I get bored with paintings that overload the viewer with too much information and detail all at once. The human eye can only take in one subject or spot at a time, and I find that the best paintings 
are those which reveal themselves slowly and engage the viewer for long periods of time. The longer a viewer stays involved with your painting, the more lasting the painting's impact can be. Now, we artists, we design our compositions with a visual hierarchy so that the viewer's eye goes to one primary location in the image and then it's slowly drawn through and around the image. And by emphasizing certain details while at the same time de-emphasizing others, we can engage the viewer in sort of a hide and seek, thus allowing the viewer to, to become a participant in the process. The French artist Jean-Léon Jérôme is a great example of this idea. His works are loaded with detail, but he never used detail in a way that they competed with the main subject. The details were always subservient to the subject. He never gave the viewer more than the eye could handle at any one moment, yet he still included enough details to allow the viewer to spend time exploring his paintings. Now, the second type of accuracy, which I think is too often overlooked, is emotional accuracy. And that's the sense of what it must have been like to be at that place at that moment. Now, the four types of accuracy that I've described, this is perhaps the hardest to define. And the reason for that is that an emotional reaction is an individual experience. How one person reacts to a scenario can be completely different to how another reacts. We artists constantly grapple with the problem of how to engage our viewers while communicating an idea or mood. Now again, some think that the solution to this is to include as many details as possible, but that's a misguided view. Any person can sit down and trace a photograph, and in doing so, could easily produce a drawing that's technically accurate, but it would lack the soul and emotion of an actual experience. We artists, we try to move beyond the simple technical accuracy and infuse a painting with life and emotion and experience. And just like with the visual accuracy, if you can communicate that emotional experience and can touch that same chord in your viewer by successfully communicating the emotional impression of a scene, then you've made a deep and lasting connection with your viewer. A good example of emotional accuracy is the work of Albert Bierstadt. Now, Albert Bierstadt, when he was painting, he made the conscious decision not to just present his viewers with literal images of the American West. Instead, he departed from the true features of his scenes and presented his viewers with idealized and melodramatic depictions of the Western landscape. He wasn't presenting facts, he was presenting the idea. And in many ways, his paintings are truer depictions of those places than straight renderings would ever be. When you view his work, you really get a sense of the breathtaking grandeur and the majesty of both the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Now, to use an example of my own, uh, about a decade ago, my wife and I were fortunate to be able to make a couple of trips down to New Zealand to visit with a client and to see some of the terrific World War I reproduction aircraft that his company was building. On our second trip, we got to spend an entire day at their airfield playing around with various aircraft and towards the end of the day, they put on a flying display with three of their very accurate SE-5As. Now I grabbed my camera and I picked a spot on the ground right off this guy's wingtip and I started shooting as all three of these airplanes warmed up their engines. It was a very visceral moment that really engaged all my senses. It was full of sights and sounds and smells and color and even a physical throb that I could feel through my body as these three engines hummed to life. The impression stuck with me to the point that a few years later I decided I had to get it out of my head and onto canvas. So what I did was I took my experience and I translated that into a 1918 setting. Now that's what I'm talking about when I refer to emotional accuracy. Now it goes without saying that for most of my paintings, I'm not actually there to experience the scene. This one was an exception. So what do you do instead? Well, just as method actors have to place themselves into a part, you have to mentally put yourself into a scene and try to visualize what it may have been like to be there. Scientifically, what makes these two types of accuracy different from a technical and historical accuracy is where they're processed in our brains. Historical and technical facts are processed and stored by the upper brain, the temporal lobe and the frontal cortex. But emotional and visual accuracy are both based on responses to external stimuli, our situations and our environment. 
those responses are processed in the more primitive reptilian parts of our brain. Now let me share with you another experience and how it impacted my latest painting. A few years ago, I was invited to participate in my first Western art show and I decided that what I wanted to do was create a painting that would encompass both aviation art and Western art. I thought, what better subject than the first Aero Squadron's involvement in the punitive expedition of 1916? In case you're not familiar with this event, let me take a moment and give you some of the backstory. On March 9, 1916, more than 1,000 Mexican horsemen under the leadership of Pancho Villa crossed the border and raided the town of Columbus, New Mexico. 17 Americans were killed as they looted and burned the town. And in response, President Woodrow Wilson ordered a punitive expedition and he assigned General John J. Blackjack Pershing to pursue Pancho Villa's forces. Pershing thought this would be a good opportunity to demonstrate the effectiveness of the airplane in military operations, and he ordered the 1st Aero Squadron, under the command of Captain Benjamin Fuloy, to Columbus to join the expedition. Pershing's plan was to use the aircraft for observational support of the ground forces. The 1st Aero Squadron arrived in Columbus on March 15th with 11 pilots, 82 enlisted men, and a small handful of airplanes which included eight Curtis JN-3s. They flew their first reconnaissance sortie on the 16th, which marked the first time an American aircraft was used in a military operation. In addition, the squadron's simple marking, a red star painted on the airplane's rudder, was the first use of a national insignia on a U.S. aircraft. On March 19th, four days after their arrival in Columbus, the squadron was ordered to report without delay to Pershing's headquarters in Casa Grande, Mexico. The pilots departed late that afternoon, but having little night flying experience, the darkness proved to be a major problem for the pilots. Only one airplane made it to headquarters that night. The next morning, two more aircraft landed. One had returned to Columbus and two others were missing. They soon discovered, though, that they had bigger problems on hand than simply the darkness. Their 90 horsepower engines lacked sufficient power to allow them to climb over the 10 to 12,000 foot peaks. Strong turbulent winds also meant they couldn't fly through the passes. Frequent dust storms often played havoc with the engines, making it almost impossible to fly and the heat delaminated the wooden propellers. Because of all these problems, many of their missions simply could not be accomplished. Now, Captain Fuloy reported to General Pershing that the Jennies were not capable of meeting the present military service conditions. Regardless, he continued to do what he could with what he had on hand. But it was decided that the planes would be used for reconnaissance flights and to carry mail and dispatches between U.S. ground units. By April, the squadron was down to two flyable airplanes and they were ordered back to Columbus. And when they arrived, Captain Floyd determined that the two remaining Jennies were in such bad condition that he had them set on fire just to make sure that no one could order him to fly them again. Now the first attempt by a U.S. military air unit could be considered a failure, but in the bigger picture it was actually a learning experience. Although they were unsuccessful in finding Pancho Villa, Captain Floyd considered this a turning point in the development of American military aviation. And during the first military air action, the first Aero Squadron flew 346 hours on 540 flights and covered more than 19,300 miles, performing aerial reconnaissance and photography, transporting mail and official dispatches. More importantly, despite the failures of the 1st Aero Squadron, the military learned that the airplane could no longer be considered an experiment or an oddity, but could be a useful military tool. Well, I created the painting for the show, but honestly, it didn't really fulfill the vision of what I wanted in the scene. Why is that? Well, because it lacked accuracy. From a technical and historical point of view, it was moderately accurate, but in my own est estimation, it lacked emotional accuracy, emotional content. That was mainly due to the fact that when I painted the scene, I had never been to Columbus, New Mexico. Sure, I was able to get uh, Google images online and 
get a rough idea of what the area looked like, but what I really needed, and that missing element, was to go to Columbus and to stand there on the site of the 1st Aero Squadron's airfield late in the afternoon. I needed to collect the technical, historical, and visual accuracy by seeing and photographing the landscape firsthand. But mostly what I needed was the emotional accuracy. I needed not just to see the landscape, but to experience the grittiness of the Chihuahuan Desert. I needed not only to see the mountains and the desert flora specific to the area, but I needed to see the colors of the landscape as the sun set low in the west and the interplay between the warm landscape and the long cool shadows. I needed to visualize the activity and the commotion as the first Aero Squadron's aircraft prepared to depart for Mexico late in the afternoon more than 100 years prior. Now honestly, I didn't ever imagine that I would ever get the opportunity to visit Columbus, New Mexico. To say that Columbus is off the beaten path is no understatement. Today it's a town of less than 2,000 people situated 30 miles from the nearest interstate, five miles from the Mexican border, and surrounded by desert on all sides. However, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to do so. It fell in my lap, really. I was traveling to an exhibition in that region and I saw that my route was going to take me near Columbus and figuring that this was an opportunity that may never come my way again, I decided to take a side trip and see that place firsthand. And doing so allowed me to fill in that missing element, that missing information, the visceral knowledge of the area. The last piece of the puzzle came just a few months ago uh, when I found out that there was a fully functioning and airworthy Curtis Jenny just a little over an hour down the road from me. Now I've been around Curtis Jennies before and I've even ridden in one, but this time my mind was in the right place. I knew I had my photo references from New Mexico and now I had already started toying around with the idea of revisiting the subject. Well, a friend of mine and I, we flew down one afternoon to see this gorgeous bird and I was able to absorb the sights and the sounds of its OX-5 engine running. And now, armed with that knowledge, I decided I wanted to have another go at the subject. Same idea, but now I wanted to create the painting that I intended to paint five years ago. Now, in the reimagined version, I'm focusing on the moment late in the afternoon of March 19, 1916, when the Jennies of the 1st Aero Squadron are starting their engines and they're preparing to depart Columbus for Casa Grandes, Mexico. The sun is low in the west and the scene is backlit. And to add to the drama, I've chosen as the center of focus that moment when a ground crewman has propped the main aircraft, the engine catches, and it belches out a cloud of white smoke as it sputters to life. I chose this moment because I find the action of propping an airplane to be particularly dynamic. It's a broad motion that involves the full body as the person contracts and twists and steps backwards at the same time. The dynamics of the motion remind me a lot of one of my favorite works of art, The David by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Now I'm not going to show you the whole painting yet. It's not finished. I've still got some work to do on the main airplane and some of the figures, but my hope is that you can get an idea of what I mean by visual and emotional accuracy. Now I'm going to leave you with a couple of final thoughts. Aviation artist Gil Cohen, a brilliant artist who's been a teacher, an inspiration, and a friend to me over the years, has said two things that have just stuck like glue with me and have helped guide my work. The first was that Art is about creating a feeling, an emotion, not about creating a pictorial catalog of the artist's knowledge and research. That made me stop and think about the content of my paintings. The second thing he said to me was simple and more direct to the point. He said, Russell, what are you trying to say? Well, I try to ask myself that with every painting. What is the idea? What is the feeling that I'm trying to get across? I try to keep it in mind whenever I'm painting. Well, if you're an artist, I hope this video has given you something to consider when you compose your paintings. 
If you're simply someone who appreciates art, I hope that I've given you a better idea of some of the thought process that goes into a painting. Thank you for watching.